Um, so this is a joint work with um, Okur Jagannath from uh, University of Waterloo and Alex Wine from NYU. Um, and I will be talking about um, hardness results, the negative results uh, on uh, using the low degree polynomial methods for the random optimization problem. And uh, let me begin by um, introducing my favorite open problem, which is probably familiar to most of you. Uh, and it's still an open problem in uh, random uh, in optimization uh, on the random graphs. So we start with the GNP. This is Erdős-Rényi graph and notes edge probability is p, and we look uh, for the largest uh, clique, largest fully connected subgraph. And it's well known that this has a size approximately twice logarithm with the right base one over p uh, of n, um, and that's an existential result. Um, what about algorithmic uh, results? What can be said about uh, trying to find a large clique uh, by algorithmic polynomial time means? Uh, there is a trivial greedy algorithm that finds a, a clique of size uh, half of that. Um, and unfortunately, nothing better is known. This was posed as an open problem by CARP um, many years ago. And uh, this is still open. And a bit embarrassing. Um, Probably because the, this transition from, from easy regime uh, where half optimal is achieved easily by very trivial algorithm, greedy algorithm, to, uh, to the regime where nothing, nothing is known is uh, uh, abrupt uh, and seems, seems like all the powers that we advances in algorithms that we have managed to achieve over the past 50 years don't seem to be strong enough to uh, overcome this barrier. Um, uh, a very similar story takes place in the sparse graphs. So here we consider an Erdős-Rényi graph where each edge has probability d over n. So average graph connectivity is d. d is constant. Uh, an interesting problem is the mirror image of the clique problem, which is the independent set problem. Independent set size is existentially known to be uh, uh, roughly of that size. Uh, I hope you can follow my um, hand uh, here. So I will use that from time to time. It is linear in N and the multiplier in front of N is known asymptotically when the degree grows. So this is a doubly asymptotic regime. First N goes to infinity, then D goes to infinity. And then the prefactor in front of N is uh, twice log degree divided by the average degree. And this is due to freeze 1990. Um, greedy algorithm finds half optimum, so factor two here is lost, and uh, nothing better is known. Um, okay, and this is equally embarrassing. Okay, so why is this problem, at least to me, interesting? Because this is just one of many examples of similar gaps that appear between what's achievable by sort of brute force method, by, uh, uh, by uh, exhaustive search methods that you can always use in any graph versus polynomial time algorithm. So many of them, many of the problems exhibit a similar gap between what's achievable by polynomial time uh, methods and what we know to be the best achievable by brute force method. And examples, some examples are listed here. This is by no means a complete list, um, but includes a random constraint satisfaction problem, a random case set problem, max cut, coloring, and so on and so forth. And in particular, it also includes uh, the problem of finding, optimizing Hamiltonian of a P-spin glass problem. Now, knowing a bit uh, audience, I don't expect that there are experts here on the spin glass theory, but no worries. I will introduce the problem from ground zero. It's, uh, it's going to be, it's a very straightforward to define a problem, certainly not easy to solve. Um, so once, we face the failure, systemic failure of algorithms to bridge the gap between the optimality uh, and polynomial time algorithms. We want to understand what's going on. Um, and uh, short of proving that these problems are uh, NP hard or something like that, which is not known, an, an alternative approach is try to understand it through the lenses of statistical physics, so to speak, uh, or uh, alternatively, Try to understand it from the um, geometry of the solution and, and, and observe that indeed many of such problems exhibit a non-trivial phase transition in the solution space. 
So something happens as you move from the regime, which is achievable by polytime algorithm to, uh, to larger values um, that prevents us ostensibly from constructing fast polynomial time algorithms. And one particular form of this abstraction comes in the in, 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 in the form of the so-called overlap gap property, which is fairly easy to define, and that can be used provably to rule out the whole class classes of algorithms. And that's what I want to talk uh, about today. So I will uh, I will introduce um, the OGP, the overlap gap property, in the context of two optimization problems on the random instances. Um, one is the spin glass model that I will introduce, and the other one is familiar that I just described earlier, the largest independent set problem in a sparse erdos schrani graph. So hopefully the second problem is familiar to at least some of you. The first problem on spin glass optimization, that's, that's I will introduce uh, in, uh, the, from ground zero. Um, and we will use this, uh, the barrier, the overlap gap property barrier to rule out some class of algorithms called low degree algorithms based on the so-called low degree polynomials. And I will also explain why those are interesting, reasonable class to consider. Arguably in some, uh, uh, in some uh, other context, these algorithms are sort of claimed to be the strongest within the realm of polynomial time uh, algorithms in the random optimization setting. So I'll, I'll get I'll get to that. Okay, so I, I will introduce the overlap gap property now semi formally, and then we'll do it more formally uh, a bit later. So suppose, and I will introduce it semi formally in a very generic form. So suppose you have some generic minimization problem or maximization problem. So that uh, now I switch for concreteness to minimization problem, but maximization is going to be the same story. So we have some objective function L. And we have some solution space capital theta from which we want to find some good solution little theta. And x here encodes the uh, problem instance. So for example, x could be a random graph. And theta could be an, a subset, uh, which is a good candidate for being an independent set of large cardinality something like that. In that case, it would be maximization problem, but here it's uh, for convenience, I switch to minimization problem. Okay, so we will, we will say that this optimization problem on instance X with this search space theta exhibits the overlap gap property if the following holds. There is a certain parameter mu which encodes the proximity to optimality, additive error to optimality, um, so it holds if there are two parameters, new one, less than new two, such that the following thing happens. Every time that you have a, a pair of solutions, theta one and theta two, which are mu good. Mu good means that there are within an additive factor mu from the optimality. So first one, theta one, and second one, theta two, are within mu of optimality. So take any two solutions. We say that the OGP holds if it, if it is the case that the distance between them, sometimes appropriately normalized, that depends on the context, is either at most new one or at least new two. And there is a gap between new one and new two. Okay, so this is an in, informal definition, basically says that every two near optimal solutions are either substantially, sufficiently close to each other are sufficiently far from each other. And if this was not clear, let me try to illustrate it by means of the following cartoon picture. So imagine that we plot the value function L as a function of the solution space theta. Here I plotted theta as one dimensional, but it's certainly many dimensional. It's like a binary cube, it's a huge space. And for each solution, we have a value. And this solution function is is anything. It's it's complicated, has lots of typically lots of local minimums and so on and so forth. Okay, so what we have, have we done? We've truncated the solution space by value mu, which is proximity to optimality. Optimal value is somewhere here. We we'll look at the threshold mu and we we'll look at the only solutions which are below this 
horizontal bar mu. So which are, in other words, have additive error at most mu. This splits the solution space into some subsets. We say that the overlap gap property holds if it is the case that uh, the subsets are such that the distances in, inside each cluster of solutions, new one, is smaller than the distance between any two solutions in two different groups. So new, new one is the largest distance inside each cluster, and new two is the smallest distance between the clusters. And if it is the case that new one is smaller than new two, we say that the overlap gap property holds. So let me pause here if, and see if there are any questions about that. Uh, and even if, if this is not entirely clear, I will introduce that now in the context of the independent set problem in a more precise terms. So obviously at any point, if you have questions, uh, uh, let me know. Okay, so let, let me continue. So here's how the overlap gap property actually probably takes place in the context of the largest independent set problem in sparse Erdos-Rheny graph. So we, we take G n D over N, H probabilities D over N. This is the model I've described earlier. So um, here's this precise statement. Uh, it's a little busy. But uh, let me sort of uh, help you with, with, uh, with words. It turns out that for any beta, which is in this interval, which is some number bit less than one up to one, this beta describes the proximity to optimality. So we fix the beta in this interval. The claim is that there exists two numbers, nu1 and nu2, between 0 and 1 such that if you take any two independent set, I1 and I2, this graph, which are beta optimum, so there are within multiplicative factor beta from the optimality, um, it is the case that their intersection normalized by the optimal value is either at most new one or at least new two. This happens with high probability as n goes to infinity. So in other words, what it what in, in generically what 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 uh, th this says is that in Erdos-Rheny graph, sparse Erdos-Rheny graph, any two independent set sets which are beta optimum have intersection size either at most new one or at least new two, and not in between. Okay. Okay. So that's that's a property which is actually fairly easy to show. Uh, it's just a st rather straightforward application of the first moment method. So you just simply count the expected number of pairs of independent sets were uh, normalized by the largest size uh, and, sh and see that between some values nu1 and nu2, this expectation goes to zero exponentially fast. And therefore, by Markov inequality, none such pairs exist with high probability. Okay. Um, we've shown that in, in, in a paper with, uh, with Madhu Sudan in 2017, because this was needed for, for, for something else, and I'll, I'll describe that later. Well, it turns out that for what I need today, I need a somewhat extended version of, of the same property, which is, again, easy to show using, the, again, the vanilla first moment method. I need a version of the overlap gap property for the interpolated family of erdos rheny graph. So let me describe the interpolated family of erdos rheny graphs first. first. We start by in, introducing any enumeration of the all pairs of uh, nodes in the graph. So these are edges or non-edges, which is altogether we have n choose two. So we just enumerate them in arbitrary order. And then what we're going to do is we're going to build a sequence of erdos rheny graphs such that each of them individually looks like a vanilla erdos rheny graph like here. Uh, but the sequence is going to be such that they are coupled in a way that every next graph is obtained from the previous graph by flipping just potentially just one edge. Specifically, 
We start with G0, which is just a random, which is just an Erdos-Schrenny graph, and go edge, uh, go pair by pair. And what we do when we go from J's graph to J plus first graph, we simply resample the J plus first edge. In other words, we forget what this edge was in the previous graph and resample it. This new sample will be one with probability D over N and zero otherwise. So we just resample uh, uh, graphs and we keep going uh, until we obtain this entire sequence of lengths and choose two of erdos schrenny graphs, which marginally look like the Schrenny graph, uh, but now they're all coupled by this uh, kind of a chaining. Some thing, immediate thing to observe is that um, the beginning graph and the final graphs are independent because to, at the end we have resampled all uh, pairs of nodes. So at the beginning and the end, these are completely independent graphs. Um, okay, so that's the construction of very simple construction of interpolated uh, Erdos Schrenny graphs. Fine. So now, so here's a statement, the more stronger statement of the overlap gap property for this interpolated family. Uh, it's again, it's a busy statement. Let me explain what it says here on the on on the statement of the theorem. Uh, in words, it might it might be hard to parse it by reading it in real time. Basically, what it says is as follows: Fix any two graphs in this entire sequence, J1 and J2. So J1 is less than or equal to J2, ranging from zero to n choose two. Fix any two such graphs and fix an independent set in the first graph, an independent set of the second graph which are at least beta optimal for the same beta as before. So the range is the same. So fix any two such independent set, look at their intersection. So just to remind, all such interpolated family lives on the same collection of nodes. So it's meaningful to take their intersection, take their intersection, divide by the uh, size. Um, and that again, the size is either at most new one or at least new two and nothing in between. So that's the extended version of the uh, overlap gap property that shows, us for the, shows up in this interpolated family. One additional thing that is needed for us is that uh, when you look at these pairs of independent set at the beginning, for the beginning graph and the final graph, only the small intersection is possible. Uh, all intersection size it cannot be just it cannot be new, larger than new two anymore. It has to be at most new one. That's not terribly surprising because not, when you have two completely independent um, random graphs and you take large independent sets in the first and large independent set in the second one, their intersection has to be small. It cannot be cannot be too large. Okay. So uh, as I transition to my switch gears and I transition to a brand new model, let me pause and see if there's any questions. This is just a description of some property of the solution space, which we will take advantage of later to construct abstractions to algorithms. So if any questions, let me know. Meanwhile, so let me introduce now the optimization problem, a new kind of optimization problem, that is the uh, problem of optimizing a Hamiltonian of a P-spin model. So it appears in spin glass theory, but it's very easy to define. So first, let me define the so-called Ising version of this model, and then the so-called spherical version of this problem. So the model is des described as follows. We consider a tensor of IID uh, uh, random quantities, each normally distributed. So the tensor is n side length n and order p. So when p is equal to 2, this is just a matrix. And each entry of this tensor is iid, normal mean 0, and standard and variance equal to this quantity. But it, it doesn't really matter what, what this standard uh, deviation is. I chose this for, for convenience of something that comes up later. OK. So, so here we have this random tensor. And now with over this random tensor, we try to optimize, find the optimal solution 
within the binary cube. So we fix the binary cube, so minus 1, 1 to the power n. So every solution is just a length n binary sequence, so plus and minus 1s. And for every solution, we simply take the inner product of matrix of the tensor A and uh, a vector sigma, the solution tensorized to the power uh, P. Alternatively, we just take the sum product expressed here. And we try to minimize in this case. We, whether you're minimizing or maximizing doesn't really matter by symmetry of normal distribution. So let's say we are minimizing. So we are trying to find a binary vector sigma, which makes this sum product as small as possible. Incidentally, when p is equal to 2, when a is just a matrix, then you're just minimizing this quadratic form uh, with respect to this matrix A. It, but it's not a trivial problem because we're minimizing only over binary cube. Okay, so then the question is, what's the optimal value? Can we find it by polynomial times? And so on and so forth. Okay, a spherical version of this problem is pretty much the same, except for binary cube, we will consider a sphere. So let me describe that. So we fixed a matrix, same ten, random tensor A, IID, normal. Uh, but now we, do, they, we take the sum product with respect to vector x, which are not binary, just to have a radius square root n. So, and so uh, we now optimize over a real uh, set of real vector, real valued vectors, and this is just a sphere of uh, radius square root n. We try to find its minimum, and uh, we want to know what's the objective value, what's the value of this minimization problem, and can we find it in polynomial time? Incidentally, for this problem, when t is equal to 2, that minimization problem is easy, because now you're just minimizing a quadratic form, sub uh, quadratic form uh, over the sphere, so this is just given by the smallest uh, eigenvalue of a, which is in Gaussian case, in standard normals, 2 square root n, so it's, it's, it's easy. But the problem is interesting when p is larger than 2, and it appears to be hard. OK, so let me, let me share with you some background. What's known about these problems, existentially and algorithmically? So existentially, these two problems have been a subject of very, very intensive study in statistical physics literature. Uh, first. Uh, in, uh, in the context of this problem, Parigi uh, introduced uh, the famous Parigi technique, the replica method and replica symmetry and replica symmetry breaking methods and so on, and, and, and the related methods called cavity. I'm, it's not too terribly important for this talk. All geared towards actually up, obtaining the limiting value of the optimization problem. Turns out you need to risk, normalize the objective value by factor n. In that case, it converges to a limit, and this limit is uh, some constant, occurs with high probability, that was heuristically described by Parigi uh, in 70s and rigorously confirmed by Talagran in 2005, and then reproved by Panchenko in a ser series of papers. Uh, and all of this you can find in Panchenko's uh, uh, recent book um, on, on this topic. All of this is just existential result. For spherical models, this was done actually earlier. It turns out that spherical models are a little more tractable, and the constant is known. Um, so uh, incidentally, the constant is known numerically for the easing uh, problem. Easing means the binary solution space, uh, and the value is given here. OK. But our goal is algorithmic. We want to know whether we can actually construct either the binary vector getting value close to this objective value, or the vector on the sphere, which is close to this objective value here. So can we do that? Can we do that? Obviously, we can always do that by brute force, but can we do that in polynomial time within some additive error epsilon? Well, by the way, the whether, whether the additive error is uh, it's an additive error or multiplicative error doesn't really matter too much once you scale the problem so that the limiting value is a constant, like it is here. OK, so the algorithmic progress on this problem is fairly recent, fairly recent. 
Um, in 2018, two years ago, uh, both problems were solved uh, in a case when P is equal, uh, uh, both problems were solved. However, in the case of the optimization of the binary uh, solution space, uh, it was solved when P is equal to two uh, by uh, Andrea Montanari. Uh, a little bit earlier, this was solved for the spherical case in more general in, in more general uh, set, uh, uh, setup. Uh, since then, I should have uh, cited a more recent paper by Montanari uh, um, uh, and co-authors who have made the progress beyond p equal to two. But remarkably, all of these uh, uh, algorithmic advances occur in the regime where there is no overlap gap property. In particular, when p is equal to two, it is conjectured, not proven, but widely conjectured, that the model does not exhibit the overlap gap property. So for two, so let me go back here. For, for this problem, minimizing, not this problem, this problem, minimizing over the binary cube, the quadratic form, it is conjectured that this phenomenon that I described for the independent set problems does not occur here. So if you take nearly optimal solutions, they and take their distances, they can span uh, the entire possible interval, which is not the case for the independent set. Okay, so that seems to be even further confirming the conjecture that overlap gap property is kind of the right uh, in indicator for the hardness of the random optimization problem. So we can't fully prove we cannot prove that, not fully. We cannot prove any kind of formal hardness of that, but at least we can rule out some classes uh, of algorithms. Okay, so uh, so let me know. Let me uh, share with you what's known about the overlap gap property in the context of the p-spin uh, glasses. So there you have to work a little bit harder. It's not as straightforward as in the case of independent set problem but quite a few things are known. Some things are conjectured. So uh, remember, let me recall that I have stated the overlap gap property in the context of Erdos-Renyi graphs for the interpolated family of Erdos-Renyi graphs. Remember, we started with this, we, we constructed the sequence of graphs spanning the full set of uh, n choose two edges. So here we're gonna do something very similar except for we're gonna do it using continuous uh, version. Let's create two independent copies of the tensor. So we generate tensor A and generate another tensor A hat independently from each other from the same IID distribution of Gaussians. And now for Gaussian, there is Gaussian random variables. There is a very natural way to interpolate between the Gaussians. So if you have two independent Gaussians, and you create this uh, some product of them, you get Gaussian of the same variance. So if you have one Gaussian standard normal and another Gaussian standard normal, and you take square root one minus tau of the first plus square root tau of the second, you get another standard normal Gaussian, uh, st standard normal, okay? So let's do that for every entry of our tensor. And that way we create this continuous family interpolating two independent instances of uh, our tensor, okay? So this is our interpolated family, okay? So we will say, again, I apologize for the busy definition, but it's morally very similar to what we had before. We will say that this family, A, family described by this interpolation, satisfies the overlap gap property if it is the case for whatever is the underlying set of solutions. Could be a binary cube, it could be a sphere, it could be whatever else uh, you care to optimize over. So exhibits the OGP. If there are, if there is a parameter mu, which is, describes the proximity to optimality, and parameters nu1 strictly smaller than nu2, which describe this kind of uh, thresholds for the uh, over, achievable overlaps, with the property that if you fix any two instances in this family marked by time tau one and another time tau two, so we have uh, one 
entry from this family and another entry of this family. So we have these two correlated Gaussian uh, tensors. We pick any two solutions, sigma one and sigma two, which are mu optimal with respect to the first one and with respect to the second one. So that is described here. Sigma one is optimal with respect to tau one. Sigma two is optimal with respect to tau two. Optimal meaning mu optimal. And then we'll look at their distance. Except here I switch from the distance, from the distance to the angle, but it's, it's, it doesn't matter because all distances are typically the same. So if it is the case that their angle, the inner product, in absolute value is either at most mu one or at least mu two, we will say the overlap gap property holds. So this definition is morally very similar to the definition I gave for the independent set problem, but um, it's now in stated in terms of the underlying solution space uh, and, and underlying problem of optimizing of the tensors. Okay, so this is the definition and the question is when, when does it hold? Well, it turns out that um, while, as I said, the, it is conjectured that for the case of the binary cube aka easing model, when p is equal to 2, it is conjectured that OGP does not hold. It's conjectured, not proven. Uh, based on that conjecture, the algorithm was constructed. However, when p is at least 4 and even, uh, this is known to be the case. Um, that's, uh, we've showed that in our paper, which was in, uh, with Panchenko and, Ram and, and uh, uh, with uh, uh, Panchenko and Mustazi Raman uh, and Weiko uh, Chen, I apologize. I've, I've missed uh, another co-author here. My apologies to Weiko. Um, uh, right, so when P is at least four and even the OGP provably holds. Uh, for the spherical model, it also um, it also holds modular sum modification that I let me not uh, let me not confuse you uh, with. You have to look at the so-called mixtures of, of 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 spherical models, but but uh, let's modular that d detail. Basically, the model is that the spherical models also exhibit uh, the uh, overlap gap uh, property. And when they don't, then in both models, algorithms exist due to Montanari and, uh, and Eliran Subak. Okay, so this is what we know about the uh, OGP. Uh, again, if you um, have any questions, uh, let me know. Maybe I was going too fast and you want me to revisit some of the things I've introduced. I'm going to switch gears once again and now talk about the class of algorithms that I want to describe and rule out by the presence of OGP. And then we will synthesize things. We will show that for this class of algorithms that I'm about to describe, the OGP, the presence of OGP is a provable barrier. And that's, that's, that's the moral of the entire talk. So let me talk about the class of algorithms. The class of algorithms is, uh, loosely speaking, is, is, is called the low degree Polynomial, uh, polynomials, even though I should say that sometimes the low degree will not be that low. It really depends on the context and depends on fair amount of technical details and assumptions. Some of them will be skipped. So what is the low degree polynomial? Um, so for convenience, think, uh, let's, um, well, uh, Remember that in the end of the day, for whatever the problem that we considered, largest independent set problem, or finding the ground, uh, uh, minimizing the Hamiltonian, we need to produce a solution. So we need to produce a vector of zeros or and ones, or vectors of plus minus ones, depending on the context. We have to produce a vector, which is close to optimality per whatever is our objective function. Okay, so this class of low, uh, low degree polynomials is constructed as is, is constructed as follows this vector will consist of n polynomials each polynomial is a low degree uh, polynomial on the input so so the in other words the, the variables in each of these polynomials are just the entries in your 
adjacency matrix or the tensor, depending on the context. If it's a tensor, then we have n to the p entries in this tensor. So x1, x, n to the p are entries. Each polynomial is the sum product of monomials. So some, each monomial is just a product of variables. So here we take any linear combination of monomials, but the low degreeness and bounded this by degree d says that the number of terms in each monomial is bounded by d. So if d is constant, then we have a constant degree polynomial. If d is log n, then we have log n degree polynomials, and so on and so forth. So we do that for each of the coordinates. We try to design such coefficients, linear coefficients, uh, in front of these monomials so that this vector hopefully does something good. Okay, so this describes, okay, uh, now, this uh, procedure gives you a vector of, uh, a vector value um, solution, but it's not necessarily binary. It's not necessarily zero and one. So some kind of a rounding needs to be uh, introduced. So if you get values between zero and one, for example, you need to somehow decide how to you round to one or how you round to zero. And that's again problem dependent, uh, and it's up to the algorithm designer how this can be done. Some such rounding techniques I will describe in the context of uh, independent independent set. Okay, so therefore the algorithm class that we described are two phase two phase uh, uh, algorithms. First, construct this uh, vector of low degree polynomials, and the second phase round, and then hope for the best. Hopefully this algorithm can do something good. Now, how powerful uh, are these algorithms and why am I considering this class of algorithms? Before I give you some list of, of, of con concrete, uh, more restricted class of algorithms that can be captured by low degree polynomials, let me say that uh, it's, it just so happens that now there's a lot of focus on the low degree polynomials because they are appear to be connected with algorithm based on some of so-called sum of squares type algorithms. Lasser hierarchy, which is the generalization of the spectral methods. It's, uh, so there's uh, uh, lots of activities in trying to understand the power of low degree polynomials, for example, for as, as their power to detect hidden click problem. Not the problem I'm considering here, but something like a hidden click problem or planted submatrix problems on many variants. So, so there's a lot of activity in this, in this space. In fact, the conference that I'm co hosting in Simons now is largely devoted to this kind of topics. So, low degree polynomials are interesting. But more concretely, they can model a certain special, a special type of uh, algorithm. So the first class of algorithms that they can model is the so-called local algorithms on sparse graphs. Let me describe that in words and, and, uh, and leave it at that. Local algorithm, if, if you have a sparse graph, graphs where each node has a bounded degree or bounded on average degree, the local algorithms are those where the decision uh, for the solution is based on the small neighborhood around each node. So, for example, you try to design a large independent set. And what you do is for each node, you just look at a small neighborhood, constant depth neighborhood around this node. You see some tree. And based on this tree and perhaps augmented by some randomization, you make a decision. So you don't look at the entire graph to make your decision. Every node does it in this kind of a distributed way. This is the local algorithm. And uh, obviously, local algorithms are of great interest in computer science in general. So it turns out that you can model local algorithms um, on sparse graphs using low degree polynomials, using certain tricks that I'm not going to bother uh, with, with you, but it's described uh, in a paper. So low degreeness, uh, lo locality on the graphs can be captured by the low degree uh, polynomials. Now, the second class of algorithms that's sort of captured by this is this spectral method, such as, for example, looking at the largest, uh, uh, the eigenvector, uh, eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue or the second largest eigenvalue, that can be captured, uh, sort of can be captured by low degree polynomials because these things are, can be approximated by power iteration uh, methods and power iteration methods with constantly many rounds can be captured by the low degree uh, polynomials. So that 
I'm skipping some uh, details here, and um, uh, but sort of uh, that that's the message. And the last class of algorithms that, uh, but not this is not exhaustive list, but another class of algorithms, oops, that captured by low degree polynomials is approximate message passing type algorithms that have been featured quite prominently in spin glass theory and, and beyond, less so in the random graph optimizations uh, uh, problem. Well, they have to some degree, but, but uh, I'm not gonna describe this class of algorithms in this, um, in, in this talk, but it's uh, uh, for many problems, they seem to be giving the most powerful type of algorithms. And including, importantly, including the positive results on P-spin optimization problems, those by uh, Montanari and Subak, those have been achieved by a variant of the approximate message type algorithms. So this is the class of algorithms that I want to describe. I've described the, the property, the overlap gap uh, uh, property, and I've described the class of algorithms. Now I want to put two things together. Um, and uh, Question? Yes, first. Uh, I, uh, um, does this include kind of normal iterative algorithms? I mean, that, that is, it seems, you know, you're looking at this thing and then you're applying the polynomials and then you round and that's it. And the ordinary algorithms that we use and develop all the time do iterations and how does that come in and how is it handled? Right, so I, I um, it depends on the iterations, uh, it depends on the details of the algorithm as I, I certainly can't claim that it will capture, uh, it won't capture all uh, iterative algorithms, but algorithms such as, for example, the power um, uh, power iteration for the uh, eigenvectors. So you, it looks like what? You take a matrix, you take a power of this matrix, another power of matrix. If you do that D rounds, then this can be captured if you expand what you get in the end, that's, that's a low degree, that's the degree D polynomial. So some algorithms are captured. That's, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, okay, so, all right. So main result, well, this is gonna be somewhat anticlimactic because I already said what the main result is. Basically it says that the presence of the overlap gap property implies a barrier of the low degree polynomials. But I have to tell you a little bit more about the actually how low should be the degree and, and so on. And things and here things get a little ugly to state because of the technical details, some of which are skipped, so, but some of the yeah, I will describe. So uh, let's see. So the first uh, result that I want to uh, describe uh, regards the optimization of P-spin model, the spherical version. Just to remind you, we have a Gaussian tensor and we optimize the inner product of Gaussian tensor with the uh, vectors on the sphere. So it's a real valued multinomial optimization problem. Um, okay, so suppose we're in the spherical model were in the regime of the spherical model where the overlap gap property holds and we more or less know when this when this can happen then the following uh is is the case so uh okay so suppose you construct a vector of polynomials and suppose this vector of polynomials has norm squared norm uh, n now that's an assumption that's a reasonable assumption because if you are trying to construct a vector on the sphere, its length is root n, so it's it's a squared length is n. So this is built in the assumption of, of, of the uh, algorithm. Then we renormalize it so that it probably uh, lives on the sphere. Okay, so we, uh, we start with the vector of polynomials which have expected length, uh, squared length n. We rescale it so that it lives on a sphere, and then we'll look at its cost, implied costs. How well, how good is that uh, uh, cost? Okay, so uh, this object, the inner product is a random object. Uh, so the uh, solution is random and solution value is random. Okay, so the assumption here is that suppose this value 
whatever value is achieved by this algorithm has comes with a guarantee uh, of this form. And I'll e elaborate on this form uh, uh, short. So it comes with a guarantee that that uh, that it pr produces value at most eta. Remember, we're minimizing. So the smaller eta, the better. Suppose we, it comes with a guarantee that it produces value at most eta with that guarantee. Uh, when you deal with polynomials of degree uh, at most d, then this value eta cannot be better than the value implied by the overlap gap property. So when mu comes from the overlap gap property, this point where the solution space splits into clusters with the large distances, uh, large distances, uh, that value cannot be broken. Now let me uh, say a few words about this guarantee. So if you have a degree uh, a degree constant here, then it basically says that I want the algorithm designer to have a guarantee of at least constant size. Right? So I want I want the algorithm to succeed with at least constant level guarantee. And that, that's not too unreasonable. Admittedly, it would be better to show that the failure of such algorithm, if it succeeds with inverse polynomial type guarantee, we cannot do that. Our technique does not work here. But if it succeeds with this guarantee, then uh, with constant uh, guarantee, then constant degree polynomials are, are, are ruled out. But interestingly, perhaps interestingly, that you can stick here even large D. You can stick even uh, linear in N guarantee. So it sounds like we're ruling out polynomials of degree n, uh, or even n squared. So with n squared degree, you can solve the problem entirely, right? Because it's it's just you know you can almost capture brute force by by putting degrees that high. Well, there's no there's no miracle here because with degree that much, you will have to ask for guarantee which is exponentially good uh, in the in, in, in exponential in the number of entries n to the p and it's just no algorithms uh, it, it's just uh, you, you cannot expect the algorithms to be uh, that good because simply the fluctuation of the of the objective function here is not that strong to to have that level of guarantee but for example interesting regime stops when these order uh, small constant times n because in this case, it says that you cannot construct degree n uh, uh, polynomials which have exponentially good guarantee. And, and that's interesting because the positive results do come with exponentially good guarantee. The algorithms which achieve near optimality, epsilon proximity to optimality in models which don't exhibit the overlap gap property, they do so with probability modular exponentially small. So that's uh, that's a that's a reasonable guarantee to expect from algorithms. So let me uh, and similar result holds for the easing model. And in I, I should start wrapping up. I believe because I was asked to talk is uh, fifty minutes should leave some time for questions. So let me just briefly go uh, um, about the similar result for the independent set problem. Now, both in the context of easing and independent set problem, I should say a few words about rounding because we need to produce the, the uh, discrete solution. So here for the independent set problem, we assume that the rounding uh, is done along the following natural lines. We, we construct a polynomial. Every value at most one is included in the independent set. But every time you have a violation, you just delete one of the nodes violating the independent set constraints. So it's very natural, uh, uh, simple uh, rounding technique. If you consider polynomials of degree at most capital D and use this rounding technique, you can also overcome the overlap gap barrier uh, in the independent set uh, problem with a guarantee, which again has degree D built into it. So degree is constant here, then this guarantee uh, needs to be at, at least inverse 1 minus inverse polynomial. If the degree is larger, then this rules out uh, algorithms with a higher level of uh, success guarantee. I should say that this 
success guarantee that we built in the assumption of the, of the problems is something that would be nice to remove. Some, it will come at some cost, but it would be nice to remove that regardless what, what, what you do, whatever you produce cannot be close to the optimal solution, such as nearly optimal independent uh, set problem. Um, now, I have a few slides, a couple of slides on the proof idea, but I'm not going to go over time. So offline slides will be posted. You, uh, you can browse through that. But basically, just mention basic key ideas uh, entering this. The key idea is a certain stability property uh, of those algorithms. Algorithms such, such as those based on low degree polynomials are stable in the sense that if the input A, the matrix, the tensor, the graph, is perturbed just a little bit, then the output, the solution vector that you achieved uh, by means of low degree polynomial is also is going to be perturbed just a little bit. So these algorithms are sort of continuous functions, sort of continuous functions of the input. Um, and that can be proven by using some technical but fairly standard noise sensitivity type results uh, and using Fourier expansion and hypercontractivity. So a lot of technical things, but which are well sort of studied now uh, and, and, and so on. So one form of guarantee comes uh, here. Um, it says that when you perturb your Gaussian matrix uh, into something else which is correlated with the original Gaussian matrix and apply a vector of polynomials, the likelihood that you perturb it too much is very small. And that can be quantified in terms of degree and the level of correlation. So I'm going to leave, and leave it at, at that. OK, so uh, I'm going to skip the remaining. Uh, and the remaining part of the proof idea is that stability implies that if you apply your algorithm over this interpolated family of instances, then at some point, your solution will fall into this forbidden region, region forbidden by the overlap gap property, where you know the solutions cannot exist. And because you fall into there, that region, forbidden region, then you arrive at the contradiction. So it's based on the contradiction uh, argument. Um, I have a couple of slides here on, on other works where similar ideas have been implemented, but in context of different types of algorithms. I'm going to skip that. Perhaps let me just highlight my kind of personal achievement here is, is that uh, we also did it in the context of the so-called quantum local algorithms. For me personally, the achievement was that I wrote a paper on quantum algorithms with still not understanding what quantum algorithms are, to be perfectly honest with you. But it uses fairly ideas that have been developed in the classical context of algorithms in, in other contexts. This is the joint work with Ed Fari and, and, and Sam Goodman. Um, and some other problems, uh, also in the context of planted models, such as planted click. And uh, I, I apologize, I went a little bit over time. I'm going to stop here, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Are there any questions? Uh, I have a question. Jane, yes. Hi, David. Um, so you, you started this. Um, the, the sequence of graph uh, by interpolating between two independent copies of GMP and then you study the independent set from any two graphs in, in the sequence. Can you tell a little bit of the motivation of, uh, of, of studying the overlap gap uh, of two graphs from the interpolation? Like, does it say something about the solution space itself or, or is it useful for something? Yes, uh, thank you, Jane. So this is this is used. It's not done just to study the problem. This is used precisely to construct a ne negative argument. To it's used precisely to rule out the algorithms. So roughly speaking, this is how it works. You have a beginning graph, you have the end graph, and then you have the interpolated family. We know that at any point, you take any two graphs in between, you take any two independent sets in between, their intersection is large or small. Okay, so we know that. We know on top of that, that as if you take the beginning graph and the end graph, then the optimal, the independent set for the beginning graph and independent set for the end graph, the intersection has to be small. It ha cannot be large anymore. So at the beginning, it could be large and small intersection for one graph. It could be large and small, but not in between. At the end, it has to be small. So think about 
trans how your solution overlaps with the solution at the original graph. At the beginning, they entirely overlap. So you, you start with one graph and one identical pair of two solutions. And then as you progress the graph to work on this interpolated family, your solution, second solution starts changing. The first solution doesn't change. As you start changing, this overlap, the intersection of independent set has to be continuous by stability. But at the same time, that means that at some point it will fall into this uh, region for which we know the intersections simply do not exist. Mm -hmm. And we know that it does not exist by this interpolate version of the interpolated family of graphs. So I, I, I know I went a little bit too quickly over, over that, but, but the short answer, yes, we need this uh, statement for the interpolated family as, in, uh, as a building block for the negative result. Okay, thank you.